I, we were coming down one day from the mountain and I says, well, how was your day? And he says, it's great. He says, do you know what I'm going to do when I grow up? And I says, what? And he goes, I'm going to ski for money. They're going to, people are going to pay me to ski. Of course, you can't go, oh, Dan, <laughs> pipe dream. Um, I says, you know what? You go for it. If you can make a living out of doing what you love to do, you go for it. Oh, and that, he was about eight. He was going to ski for Rosignol and Oakley and be the best that they'd ever seen. Real fire, you got the lem music we choose, inspire this so that we contribute. Not take no talk from the Babylon, cut off every wicked heart. Real people miss a load. Musical speaking, yes, it's on right now. Lyrical fire in and the dance in the flow. Listen to this, we drop the bomb right now, like a lion, Watch. so we go. First of all, getting a swelling under control before we could even consider operating, and from that point, then moving on to reconstructive surgery. Pure shock, insanity. Never felt nothing like that in my body up until that point in life. So it's just madness. With regards to sort of the prognosis and the difficulty of putting them back together, these bones it takes a whole it's a whole lot harder to make them fail. But when they do fail, it's maybe a little bit more difficult to get them lined up correctly. So. Uh... You know, it was really bad, but in all reality, if, if I was just thinking, you know, back to that day, if I would have gone five miles an hour slower and my whole body hit that wall to a dead stop, that could have been lights out, you know. And uh, for a lot of folks, depending on what you're doing for a living, a calcaneus fracture can be a career-ending injury. Tanner was pretty wired right from the get-go. Whoa. He is the most ADD human I've ever met in my whole entire life. He's there, 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 and everywhere. I, I had a smart mouth back in the day, I'm not even gonna lie. That guy's a piece of shit. Running around, throwing something at you. Hey, why not? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you live in Kalispell, Montana, long winters, and I thought, well, get him going and skiing, and then that way maybe he'll get me back to skiing. He took off right away with it. Same. And that was at three. <laughs> back in the day in Kalispell, the little video rental store, they always had all the ski movies back in the day. I'd always go rent Blizzard of Oz and License to Thrill. Those were the only two movies that I'd rent. That's all I wanted to be. I seen Plague for the first time with Mohawk coming up here and coming out the backside with that big glittery jacket on, tripping. Bebop mono skiing, smoking cigarettes. I was like, who the fuck is this, man? Are you kidding me? Lux interior. He sings for the cramps and he's got pants like these. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, he's pretty hot, you know. He's definitely 
Elvis, you know. You know, Tanner and I grew up like normal Americans, I guess. You know, we were when going to church every Sunday. Parents had us involved in all sorts of sports. He he struggled with his concentration. School fucking sucked, dude. <laughs> Which, I, at some points, even now, he still, you know, has a hard time. The first time I remember just sitting in there looking at my teacher like, yo, I'm never going to need this shit. And I knew it back in the day. It was prison to me. I don't know if it was ADD. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know if ADD existed when we were growing up, you know? It seems like that's just like something new that came up so we could feed kids drugs. I remember going to some races that Tanner was in. Well, he comes down through three gates leaves the course, and the mothers are going, where'd he go? I go, oh, there he is. <laughs> oh, he just went off a jump. Came back in and finished the course, and of course the coach said, he's done. But then Steve Knox moved into town and started up the freestyle team. From the beginning, you could tell that he was seriously passionate about skiing. You know, I had a clan of three dudes from Montana that were just insane. The first dude's Donovan Powers, the second guy's Tony Gilpin, and the third guy's Mickey Price. The Northern Division Freestyle, Montana skiing is totally awesome. <laughs> it's family. Uh, everybody's trying to help each other out all the time. You don't need these and people are just pumped to go skiing, you know? This little kid shows up. He's got kind of some new school baggier clothes than you'd usually have. He has a red... Uh, Elmer Fudd hat, kind of a little smart ass kid, real loud. They're, they're not looking for anything else outside of just the feeling skiing brings to them and passing down their knowledge because they've been, you know, coaching little kids for mogul skiing and whatnot for a long time now. His mother drops him off at the ski camp at the Chateau Rouge in a red convertible Mustang. He's 10 years old. Darla says, this is my boy Tanner. Give him anything he wants. Take care of him. I think we taught him how to do a front flip and a back flip in, you know, first week. There's never been a kid show up and just do back flips on this jump. I mean, I don't think anyone did it except for coaches, maybe. Skiing with these, you know, little older dudes that would get all stoked, they called me the mini shred. Natural talent with crazy ADD nature, you know, just like really needed something to focus on all the time. He's really, you know, Twitchy. You gonna take the moguls tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Close up. Just a part of the crew after, you know, a couple years, like after a year of just shredding around him. He got exposed to like more freestyle life early than most kids do. Some of the culture was uh, hanging out at the bars. <laughs> Don't get all camera shy now. Speech. We all felt we were going to teach these kids how to ski. We weren't there to chaperone them. We uh, kind of let them do their own thing after that, and we would definitely turn our heads. Yeah, that's kind of where I started smoking weed. We had a bottle of Jack Daniels that was on the top of the refrigerator or some cupboard up there or something. And we come home from dinner, and here's Tanner holding this bottle, and he's chugging away on it as fast as he can. Pull that away and we're like, you're crazy. You don't need to be touching that stuff. We're like, you got a big day tomorrow. You're going to be skiing hard. The second day, he, he's like, oh, man, I should have listened to you guys. He's like, that was tough. And, you know, he was 10 years old. Anyways, we were at Big Mountain, Montana, and uh, ran into Tanner up there. That's when I first met him. He was probably 11 or 12, I think. Latched on to that guy for the whole weekend. I'm sure he got so sick of me. <laughs> remember being on chairlift rides with him and just asking, just digging questions, you know. What was, what was it like filming for Snow What? Uh, dude, License to Thrill was the sickest, dude. Do you still mono ski? Like shit like that. In my mind, I was meeting, you know, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Somewhere in those years, I remember uh, riding a chairlift and watching somebody ski. I remember watching License to Thrill in the fourth grade, just being like, holy shit, man. And it, right then and there, it was like, I'm, I'm skiing. That's what I'm gonna do. This is me. This is what I'm gonna do. I was hired, you know, to organize a freestyle program. Yet, 
organized freestyle is an oxymoron, you know. <laughs> they built some big kicker and um, he was doing some flips. We had to kind of get into it and then he got pretty bummed out uh, because we had a policy that you were going to get like kicked off the team if you did inverts. Well, he started working on us about 13, not getting along with the coach that well and wanting to take it one step further. Tanner was a favorite of my coach, Cooper Shell. And Tanner was one of his like, you know, guys he was like into. This kid was a hot shot and really young. He's very particular about his who he likes and who he doesn't like and his skiers. And I had to convince him to like me at some point to coach me. And it just meant, you know, with Cooper's endorsement, you knew. So I started paying attention to him, right? And I remember him just telling me like, I'm going to be the next Johnny Moses. I'm going to the Olympics. I'm going to go win a gold medal. After that, I don't know, man. My, my dad and my mom just really thought like this uh, mogul skiing, going to the Olympics was, was super possible for me. He had started going down to Park City to do the water ramps. Worked on us all summer. Found out about the winter school and go to school for seven months and then you get five months off in the winter. To a normal kid that has to go to school all year and then only gets three months off in the summer, you're like, wow, oh, that sounds great. You know what, I wanted him to stay home, but then I thought, well, you know, he does have a talent and he's not gonna be able to go where he wants to go here. To be a fly on the wall listening to my parents talk that one out, it had to have been a, just a, a nervous decision. Agonizing. Tyson was leaving the next year for college, and if Tanner left, it was empty nest syndrome for us. So after a lot of talk and debating, packed him up and moved him to Park City. Yeah, the first when I first got out here, it was it was a paradise to me, man. I was just wanting to ski every day, and that's exactly what I got to do. Kerry was uh, heavily involved with the USSA and uh, the mogul and, uh, and inverted aerialists. My job is really, number one, to open doors of opportunity and access for them. Their job is to keep it open. I delivered him to Kerry Miller's home, which was scary. <laughs> And she kind of is, is kind of real sketchy about, well, I'm about ready to leave my baby boy here and I don't know much about you. And I said, well, ask any question you want. Starter, Carrie Miller, he just kind of, he's, you know, not gonna lie, dude, you're a fucking weirdo, right? So I remember her first question was, oh, you're not a butt pirate, are you? <laughs> I said, uh, no, as a matter of fact, Darl, I said, if you weren't married to his mother, I'd probably make a, a run, dead run pass at you. I, I got to give him props, man. Those 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 contests that I that I first came down to, he came he, he came at me and my family with open arms and said, if you really want to make your dreams come true, I'll help you out and you can you know live with me for the first little while until we can find you a host family in Park City. So when I left him and uh, I cried from Salt Lake City to Kalispell, Montana. <laughs> These kids come in and are usually been at home and taken care of by mom and dad. I can kind of do that. My job is to try and make them responsible to themselves. Uh, I hope you know, don't you screw up tonight. My big thing was I always wanted him to be, become a really good person. Something you have to train, something you have to be at the events, something you have to be responsible for packing yourself. Mom isn't dragging around picking this stuff for you, you have to. I remember being over at uh, Carries and we were all kind of sitting around for the new points list to come out and he came out 38th and I thought that was huge, you know. I thought, well, crap, there's, what, 20 on the team and by the time he's old enough to compete in, in the Olympics, they'll all be gone, so things aren't looking too bad for him. And then when Tim started winter sports school, he moved in with, um, Marcy and Mark Stegemeyer. They were such a stable family, and I mean, it was just awesome, and they just treated him like a son. Cool story, actually. Mark Stegemeyer is like 1979 world inverted aerial champion. But if he makes this, but he should win the overall. And that does it. 20 year old Mark Stegemeyer wins the $19,000 Grand Prix Championship. 
But they were tough on him. I mean, if he screwed up, they were they were on him, and, and we got a pretty good comfort level. It was kind of cool to get guidance from a guy every now and then that kind of is, went through what I'm going nice, through now. Nice, Tanner. I was sitting there one day, and he walks in the door and gives her a big hug, and, hi, Mom, to her. And I'm going, oh, oh, my goodness. And then he turns around and goes, oh, my gosh, it's my mom. And, you know, I was heartbroken. And then I'd leave and go to my motel room, and it was like, oh, she gets my son. That's my son. <laughs> This dog don't hunt with me. I we gotta buy a condo or something, so I can come down and be mom. Everything was really good for that first year. Right from there is a whole different story. Somehow I convinced my parents to buy a condo and let these guys move in and caretake me at this place. We were pretty nervous about that. Tanner knew we were probably also gonna be the coolest guardians he could probably pick because. You know, we partied already. And these guys are a bit crazy. They probably had to have been at least 22, 21, and I was 15. It went along real well at first. They were fabulous. I mean, they really were. Yeah, those guys are retarded. In fairness, Darla was, went down there a lot. Yeah. That's how we figured we could control it. And you know, they'd bring the gals over, and I thought, oh my goodness, he's really gonna get Educated. We had this agreement about rules. Well, there was no rules at the house. No drugs. I'm just moving in. I had a bunch of hits of acid. No, uh, no big parties. And I'll tell you what, man, it was fucking crazy. It was okay to have friends over. I know they were making porno in his fucking basement. Uh, fuck, man. I might have made a few sex tapes in the basement. But they weren't pornos. I, ha I had a crazy girlfriend at the time. You know, kids are kids. Yeah. And... I guess I'll leave it at that. He was still doing some mobile contests, but he was getting into park riding, and yeah, his name was just kind of exploding. <laughs> I remember my parents saying, your brother's going to uh, compete in the US Open for free skiing. And I was thinking, well, is that a mogul event? And my parents were like, no, it's a, it's a slope style course. And that was news to me at the time. I remember them calling me afterwards and I think he got fifth. And then after that first US Open, it was over. I can't take no more of this. I gotta do what I wanna do, because I love skiing. But having somebody try to tell you how to do it when you know you're better and I'm at it, it's kind of retarded. I just remember my dad saying, your, your brother doesn't want to go to school anymore. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to do any moguls. He's done with it. He's told me that all he wants to do is pursue a free skiing career. Yeah, my mom was just disgusted. I was like, fuck this, dude, I am done. It's like racing and freestyle now that everybody's just, I mean, they go out and train and then they go home, they, didn't, they don't have fun. Now that this jumping, this new school for you guys stuff starting to pick up, I mean, skiing's just changing and people need to get with it. It's the new thing. Yeah, you had a chance to go do something, be creative in a different form, be freer to be creative. In some sense, you would think that the Olympics would be powerful enough to keep him down there, you know, keep him, keep him over there in, in the mogul realm. Well, the Olympics are, you know, a monumental thing. And here's this fledgling sport that most people hadn't heard of. I asked somebody who was involved with the USSA about it, and guy says, well, honestly, it's a fad. Two years and it'll be gone, so don't worry about it. Well. Jim Moran event, he won that event, and that was a slope style event. Oh my God, what is it? I am across 540 Tanner Hall, approaching the Tanner Jump, watch this. First win ever in slope style, which is pretty ridiculous when you're beating all the dudes that kick your ass in moguls, but then you just beat them all on jumps and rails. My bad, the legendary Tanner Halls. Yeah, Tanner! Just a few ass you know. <laughs> and by that time, we all 
were in favor and understood that we were gonna lose Tanner to free skiing. He got these sponsors that wanted him to come to photo shoots and do this and that. Every ski shop you walked into, it was plaque everywhere all over the ski walls, and I was like, that's, you know, kind of my hero right there, so he wears Oakley, I gotta wear Oakley. That summer, we uh, offered Tanner a two-year contract. Well, when I signed with Rousing All at Oakley, my, pretty much my life dream came true. He just fit Oakley, you know, he was rebellious and getting into trouble. I wanted to become a, a filmmaker, a free ski, and he wanted to become a free skier. So I was like, hey, let, be in my movie. You know, I was I just bought a camera and quit school. You're going to school in the summer. So he started missing classes. From there we went out to um, Lake Tahoe to film. Drove out there, smoked a bunch of cron, skied for like a big, you know, had a fucking sick week of skiing out there. And then right when we come back to school, first day back to school, there was a random drug test. I get pulled out, right? Tripping. Wasn't stoked. Knew I was gonna fail. Got called out of class. Said I was suspended for five days. Pretty much this 15 year old kid introduced me to weed. Like, I didn't smoke weed before. I played baseball. Sorry, bro, that, that sucks, man. What do you got to say? He's getting hot, dude. Yeah, he is. This shit, we've been here for a fucking hour. We lived for every day, and every day was an opportunity because every day something new was created. Tanner's like, I don't wanna go back to school. I'm like, I don't wanna go back to Hollywood video. We were just straight up like, this is the shit. Why would we do anything else? Eventually, he pulls up in front of the school one day, gets out of the car and lights up a doobie and out come the teacher and he was gone. Are you kidding me? Really? Walked into the principal's office, picked up my, you know, picked up my backpack and basically threw the peace sign to him and gave him a big smile and thanked him for putting me on the biggest vacation of my life. You know, for parents, it was a nightmare. We saw all of his dreams going up in smoke, but, you know, by then he already had new dreams. You know, kind of let us down on his part of the deal and that he'd have to be done. I mean, that's all there is to it. I made a whole new set of rules for him. Figuring out life, trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do and how, you know, we're going to make all life come back together for me because at that point it kind of seemed like everything crumbled to the ground. We ended up not having a very good end of the conversation, hanging up on each other, and we didn't talk for six months. I can't move back to Kalispell and start going to Flathead High School again. And I says, I'm sorry, but you had your chance. We didn't want to lose him as a, as a child, as, as our son, but we couldn't, couldn't let him go off and, and just destroy his life either. My dad as well, when he was young, went through some shit with alcohol. It's kind of funny, man. He was gonna, he was, my dad was one of the best bowlers around when he was a younger kid. Could have gone on the pro bowling tour and could have did a lot of good things, but got himself into a bunch of trouble and, you know, he paid the price. Darla actually continued to talk to him and got us back together on the phone one time. And Tanner says, look, Dad, you know, I'm sorry that I'm disappointing you, but this is something that I really want to do. I think this sport is just going to continue to grow, and uh, I want to be a part of it. I think I'm really good at it, and I can be the best at it. All I'm asking from you is one year. I know I'm onto something right now. I know it ain't mogul skiing. I know you don't know about this stuff, but I like give me a year, bro. I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna dominate. I didn't say it like that, but that was kind of in my head. Let's see what happens. And if I fall on my face, I will promise you I will go back to Kalispell and start my freshman year of high school all over again. And Darla and I talked about it numerous occasions. And we realized that there's no way he was going to be happy here. It seemed that that's the way skiing was going, that it was impossible to deny, you know. He's too, he was just too good. Okay, Here, here's the deal. You go for it, and you prove what you can do. He wrote up a contract with me signing, saying I got one year to kind of prove myself. If my brother was successful at it, my dad would, you know, my, well, my parents, for that matter, would allow him to continue doing 
what it is he wanted to do because they still didn't fully understand it. I mean, the risks he was taking physically and what he was being compensated for those risks, it was, it was awful. Tanner had to win to make any money. Signed that contract and, you know, right from there, moved out to Mammoth. And, you know, I kind of moved out to Mammoth with a suitcase and got dropped off at Motel 6. And at that point, I just wanted to take those tricks that I learned and just apply them to the, the season after and just see what would happen. Because I knew not too many people were doing them. Did you feel pressure or were you just kind of skiing for fun? Um, I felt pressure at the X qualifier because I really wanted to go to the X Games. Go up there, lay it down, end up winning that, got my X Games spot. Dad was super stoked, call him up, like, all right, let's just keep it going. Go to the Red Bull Huck Fest, end up winning that the weekend right after. He's just like, holy shit. And I tell him, I was like, yo, I just picked up Red Bull as a sponsor. He's like, Whoa, okay, holy shit, huh? So I go to the US Open two weeks later, get third in slope style and end up winning the Big Air. $6,000, the king of the Big Air here at the US Free Skiing Open. Give it up for Tanner. Jerry and I are going, hmm, maybe there's kids on this something. Doing some of the first cap sevens, you know, and it was like the, the new trick, you know, at the time. And, you know, I was just so impressed, you know, because everything he was doing, was, he was doing it with style, you know, and you could see that he was really, it was really easy for him. In my head, it was all wraps back in the day. It was pretty much on top, you know, podium in almost every contest. Some of the best segments out there. He just had, for some reason, I just thought, hey, like how he, how he, his swagger and just everything, how he promoted himself. Everybody's throwing down, so it's like you can't even hold back, you know, you just got to go for it every time. Kind of linked up with him and CR. Yeah, Tanner and I met when we were 14 years old in Mammoth, and we took the chair up and hit it off right away. To ski together, had so much fun and hit it off so well, we became pretty much best friends after that. See buds Cool. T-Dog. Breaking the law. Just all of our lifestyles kind of clicked, you know, and Evan kind of took me and CR under his wing. From then on, I mean, it just seems like for the next, like, two or three years after that, we were just always on the same program. Where's Johnson at? <laughs> Dude, the earlier we leave, just the easier it's going to be. That's what I think about it, Johnson. So then it was came the X Games. We're clear. Judges are ready. Tanner, Mighty Mouse, over 120 pounds, not getting enough speed, trying to get pushed, and he wants to do his biggest trick, but he's not getting the speed that he needs. So here comes the third final jump. Switch Rodeo 720, tail grab, extra style points for that one. Skied over to me, and he goes, don't get too excited, but I might win this. Let's hear it for our big air champ, Mr. Tanner Hall. That was... That was still the best X Games ever because me, CR, and Evan were all living together and we all took one, two, and three, so. I just remember watching him on TV win that thing. And like, that, to that point, might have been one of the happiest moments of my life. I was so stoked for my brother. It wasn't even a conversation on the phone. It was my mom just screaming and going crazy. She was so stoked and, and my dad was super proud. And, it was a very cool experience to have as a family. <laughs> you know, it turned our world upside down. The fact that my brother had chosen a path, set a goal, not only did he achieve it, but he just shattered it. It was really fucking cool. <laughs> like that feeling is like, cool, man. What's that word, euphoria? So he went from pain to come to ski camp to like, Please come to ski camp. We'll pay you like, within a year. My dad saw how passionate I was about it and just saw the, you know, I was serious about it. So he, he, he took a chance and I think that was the best chance he took. And he said, Dad, you know, I don't want to say I told you so, but I did. <laughs> and we both laughed because by then he was, he was it. He was the guy and in free ride. It's really good to think because, I mean, I'm, I'm not doing that well in school right now and I'm not sure that I might finish high school. I think, 
I think I'm just going to chill out and ski. You get to go and make a living doing what you love more than anything for the rest of however long it's going to be. I was thrilled for him, but at the same time, you know, I, I still think he needs his high school education, and it's a big deal to uh, Mom and I. Just because you're earning a, a certain amount of monetary uh, compensation doesn't mean that you don't need school. I'm never going to quit trying to make it happen. As long as I'm here, he's going to have to hear those questions and <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> if, in fact, traveling the world as a pro skier is going to give you the education or experiences that you will learn from, then so be it. There was so much going on at Rousey that didn't involve free skiing. And when Armada came around, you know, I, that was the perfect thing. That was going to be 100% focused on free skiing and, you know, a rider-driven company, and it sounded awesome. We approached him and asked him if he wanted to be part of it. Yeah, man, I want to be on the team with all these guys. It sounded righteous. You know, we're a startup, so we don't have that much money. We can offer you some ownership. We can, we can give you probably our highest salary out of our whole team, you know, but it's still the smallest salary compared to any other superstar. And it was important to him to move the sport forward. I just thought in my head, if we got Armada going and we killed it for the first, you know, first couple of years, especially over worldwide TV with X Games and whatnot, having our skis plastered over there every year, there's no telling what could happen. He went up to Rosno when his contract was up and he said, hey, give me what you give Bodie Miller. I'll stay. And I think he knew the answer before he asked, and I think his dad knew the answer before they asked, and he was on Armada and screaming and carrying the colors. He sacrificed a ton of money. But it, that was never the most important thing for him. The sport was. 03, 04, 05, um, as contest-wise for tenor was actually dominance and, and, and I don't think nobody was willing to beat him. There was definitely a confidence level that I'd never seen before. Like he, he knew that he was the best at what he was doing. Everybody was like yapping and whispering about stuff like, yo, what do you think T's gonna do? Basically, Tanner's so good because in his little world, reality and video games are the exact same thing. And when he's skiing, he's in the video game, man. His competition mind is amazing. And he is so in his own of his own. Like I had a robotic machine in my brain working from outer space. He works so much harder than anybody's ever given him credit for. And that's a story that probably needs to get out, the fact that how hard he does work. You know, he's so competitive. Like there's just no alternative to being the best. Skiing became a full on addiction for him. Boy, let me tell you, cause I'm talking with emotion. Cause this is my life right here, man. I love this stuff. To press tranny, your first run into a pipe, to get to the flat bottom, to go up for your first hit, I'll tell you what, it's better than sex, bro. One of the biggest events was uh, Core Games in Japan. You know, at that point, I didn't really have any sponsors, and I'd seen Tanner win, you know, multiple big checks over the last years. And then, you know, obviously going into finals, I was like, there's no way I'm going to win this. So I was really trying to convince Tanner, like, you want to split the prize money? And so they're like, yeah, whatever, we'll just do that. And I actually ended up winning the contest, and it was like 20, 30 grand. I mean, at that time, it was the biggest prize purse in skiing. So I get this, you know, stack of cash, huge. I mean, for me, I didn't have any money at that point. And then I just, like, had to give away a big stack of cash to Tanner that I knew had already made a shit ton of money. And after that, I never split it a single prize purse. <laughs> just a bunch of people changed so much and started to bringing something negative to the industry, you know, like where it wasn't fun anymore. It was about paper chase, you know. Thanks to all my sponsors, Dino Star, Leo Zari Sport. Contracts, sponsors, contests, people, medias, and, and all that goes and, and makes this whole package of this new scene. 
Well, listen, a lot of hip hop back then and a lot of dancehall and stuff, and everybody has to claim some crew, you know? So we're like, dude, let's make the C crew. It was T, um, me, CR, Pep, and right around the block, we had all these snowboarder kids, the Provo brothers, uh, Tommy Leontela, Zach Siebert, and, and all these kids, and that was the C crew back, that was like the big time C crew then, and I was like, boom, that's there. So we were like the, the hated kids, you know, like, the weed smoker ones that would listen to gangster music. Whether you want to be or not, you are going to be a mentor. You are going to be a role model. Darren's not a mentor. He's a skier. You want to be a skier? Follow him closely. Use him as a mentor. If you want to use him as a role model for not to drink and not to smoke, wrong person. Mm. Can't promote that to the kids, man. I think Tanner was able to smoke so much yet still function because Number one, you develop such a strong tolerance yeah. when you're smoking pot, you know, all the time that it really almost doesn't affect you. It's almost like when you're not stoned is when you feel it. I mean, it becomes the norm. There's a big movement going on in the United States with legalizing it just for the medical use. And I mean, it's, there's a reason behind it. You know, alcohol is a lot worse. I'll tell you that much right now. I mean, it's been part of skiing culture. The first time I ever saw someone smoke pot, was I was skiing at Hunter Mountain when I was probably six years old and some dude on the chair next to me lit up a roach clip and was like, don't, don't do this when you grow up. And I knew, I knew what he was doing. And Rastaman always carry his righteous spliff and he might light up in the name of Ja Rastafari, seen? But for me, it's a personal preference and I don't want to promote it to anybody. I don't want to promote it to kids and, you know, I am who I am and I like weed. When you're like 46, still smoking weed and drinking like that? Yeah, you got some issues, buddy. You might, uh, most of us quit doing that by the time we were 24, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think there's a lot of skiers that, that smoke that much. Tanner just happens to be the one that's able to win the contest, too. And the guy from Oakley looked at me and said, you know, we're going to make him a rock star. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> Your bottles, it's on. Yeah. Huge change. Emails, uh, letters were coming to the house. Of course, then I have to buy all the magazines and go to the counter. My son. <laughs> I mean, I don't care who you are as a parent. When, when other adults and kids are, are pumping you up about your son, yeah, it's, it's nice. Now he's got Steez. Now he's like rocking this nice pickup. He's got woofers in it. He's got living in a nice house. You know, he's like always fresh new clothes and all that. Yeah, for sure it was different with chicks, man. Going up into ski towns and getting girls, was just, it got easier and easier. When he and a girl start getting close, and then comes the season, and it's over because he doesn't have time for that anymore. He's got a job to do. Well, there's this little cutie from fucking Ontario. I don't know, man, I'm excited to get back and see her. Going out to the bar and getting drunk, you know, becomes the segue into, into having, you know, any type of relations with girls, you know, and using your star power. That's a dangerous combination right there. It mainly comes down to sex at that point. It wasn't even a relationship type thing. A couple girls claiming they were pregnant and, and you're you just made it up. Well, yeah, well, I don't know. I do. Did you do her? <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, how he would handle it. <laughs> Whether it would go to his head and uh, the whole thing come falling in around him. Yo, why it. do you have to make a scene, man? Why don't you just let a smoker join? If I smoke, will I be as productive as you? Will I be completely over everything you yeah. <laughs> I'm over this right now. You guys can suck my really dick. It's really hard to not go nuts when you're like that good and that famous. I mean, I think he's had unfortunate people surround him for a long time. Some of his friends were fucked up. I think it was very hard for him. Anybody put in a situation where they're almost instantly famous, your thoughts almost get drowned out by everybody else's praise. He's, um, what, 17? He's winning X Games. He's 
I mean, he bought his first condo at 18. I mean, really? Jerry had to go down and sign for it. Just kind of got a little cocky. I was coming in confident again. I was just freaked out about their little policy rule. If you got caught smoking pot, it was a one-strike policy. You'd get thrown out right away. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only thing I was worried about. So the <laughs> scheme wasn't even working by. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to pinpoint why. I'm sure being around me didn't totally help. I remember being angry a lot when I was a kid, and you know, I, I definitely had an attitude. Fucking 2005, Sea Crew, Park City. It's almost a wrap. When I was a kid, my favorite skier was Brad Holmes. It was because he had attitude. I thought that was cool. When you're doing it, and when you look back 10 years later, you have totally different perspectives. Unless you have a PR agent who's making you do like the promotional things that make you not sound cocky like take the photo with a bunny rabbit or kiss a baby or you know it's not the lifestyle we have and tanner is one of the few people that goes out there and just tells you what he thinks i think he's a pussy i think it's whack what he said in the magazine fuck you you little bitch Mwah. he's he's being himself problem is he has a camera on him of course you have haters coming around and of course, you have dudes you never met. You, you don't know who they are. And, and you just got no clue what the hell you doing here. And why are you talking all the smack? Because, come on, man. Like, who's you? So, who are you to judge me? You judge me for the friends that I keep. You judge me for the cars for the place that I sleep. You can't stop inspired music. Now, this kind of thing. But without haters, what, what would an idol be, you know? Every legend has his pack of haters, you know? And I was just floating, partying, skiing, smoking weed. That was it. The quote-unquote rock star lifestyle, professional skier lifestyle. Um, there's a lot of elements that are great. Some, some other elements I think are, are negative. He doesn't have somebody to tell him no. It's whether or not you have the, the will and the wherewithal to overcome that and tell yourself no. Do you think the lifestyle he lives holds him back from being a good person? At times I have really felt that, yes. I find myself a lot of times having a conversation with him and you'll just see him not even fucking listening to you. When, when people are talking to me and I, and I zone out, because it happens a lot, you know? It happens a lot, man. You know, he's, he brings up something and, and you're bringing up your point then and all of a sudden, where the fuck's Tanner? And you're like, hey buddy, I'm just a lot going on up in there, you know what I mean? So I think I got ADD like crazy, but I think there's no such thing as ADD. I just think that I got the, I just got a, I just got ADD. <laughs> <laughs> Those years, like as a late teenager growing into your 20s, there was more changes I expected to happen that actually didn't happen. All of the peripheral uh, business that he has to attend to kind of goes by the wayside. The only check the kid's ever touched in his life is the big plastic one above his head. There's one for you. Is that true? Yeah. Calls up, hey, did you pay my Verizon bill? I didn't have your Verizon bill. He, he skis and there, there's nothing else. What Tenor needs in life is, um, is somebody to be a brain for him. Like, that's the thing we're so alike. Like, if we think too much, goes up to the brain, fucks with the rest of the body. It's just not working. To a certain extent, that's it's maybe a bit of a character flaw. But on the other hand, you can also argue that maybe he isn't where he is if he didn't have that kind of mentality. First time that I knew there was a struggle was when we got a call from Tanner and he was in the bail jail. Yeah, the veil night sucked. Um, horrible night. Apparently he got a little uh, tanked up in the bar and swash buggled a little bit and made some people mad. That's one night I wish I remember more because I remember getting beat up and I remember sitting in jail. Well, it was in the newspaper. They did a big write-up right after it happened and then it was all over the radio in the morning. It really made me feel like crap, you know what I mean? I knew I acted like an idiot. We talked about things and uh, agreed that he ought to write, the, write an apology to the 
City of Vail. I'd again respect, you know what I mean? I was there in their town and, you know, I was in the wrong. Consequences of that. Um, well, I'd like to think that he uh, learned a bunch from it. And I'm sure he learned some, but I don't know that uh, he learned everything he needed to learn from that experience. It really made me just never want to drink again, but I, I kept drinking afterwards. But then there's that spirit in him. Okay, I'm going to sit here in jail. Okay, now am I going to just feel sorry for myself that I screwed up? What am I going to do with myself? I'm going to pack myself up to the pipe tomorrow, and I'm going to win it. Tanner heads up there one more time, a very familiar spot. I think when he does screw up or did screw up or still screws up, he finds a way to fix it. I guess anyone that calls Tanner selfish, I mean, all they have to do is look at Armada. You know, what he did for the sport to leave all that money that time, whether it was the big salary he gave up or the salary he did make and in invested in movies. The energy that he puts uh, towards his movie, for example, uh, it's huge, like uh, to be an athlete and to, uh, to be able to provide uh, five movies during your career, it's, uh, it's incredible. But every time a movie comes out, it changes the sport. And it's just crazy to see the level of the movies and the level of competition just rise. I speak the right lyrics on the right beat. Roll with the chrome 45 on my feet. Motherfucker, don't you ever get caught on my street. I put you in the ground, blow your leave on my feet. You see, I got a good mother. She has a good son. I had some good girls. We have some good fun. I hustle hard so my niggas making big funds. We drive some big cars and carry big guns. My neck is feeling the strain because the pain when Chad's got what he was doing that day was, you know, really cutting edge, really gnarly. Even still, I mean, I don't know who wants to hit that thing switch. That was like a really high point in my career right there, a highlight, you know. Uh, ended up being, you know, like the best and the worst day of my life. I knew there was an inherent danger in what he was doing, but I just, it was always pushed into the back of your mind. It's like, ah, oh, that'll never happen. There's no way. When I look back at it, that's the stupidest thing I've ever done in my career to hit that. You know, I felt like I was going fast. When you're going that fast, when you're going like hitting the 50 mile an hour range backwards, it's hard to tell. I got up to the jump and then, you know, kind of felt something was wrong right off the takeoff. Right at about 7.20 coming around, I could see the, the landing and I was just, you know, about a foot short. You know, it was terrible to stand up there and hear, hear that sound and, you know, that really changed my career because, I, I mean, that my head was not the same after that. It took me almost a year to kind of get my confidence back because it was just, it was just so gnarly. Stay there, Tanner. Don't move, buddy. I gotta get this one out of my foot. And there he was sort of splinted provisionally just to keep things stable. Oh my God, that one's You're pretty good. good. The outside aspect of his ankle. Uh, it was pretty blown up in there. On the side that needed the operation, we approached from the outside side, from the lateral side. Uh, sort of opened things up, pushed the, put, pulled the tendons to the side. Uh, we were able to directly see the pieces of the talus and the calcaneus that were displaced. Uh, we put them back together where they needed to be and then held them with plates and screws. He was hurting. I felt terrible. I couldn't be there. Yeah, they said, well, here's the thing, you know, we don't know if you'll ever ski again. You might not ever walk again. The hardest thing initially for him was my career's over. I thought it was going to be a really seriously detrimental blow to his career and to himself mentally. If Tanner couldn't ski, I don't, I think Tanner would have, uh, <clears throat> He'd have to find a very creative outlet to channel his energy. I don't know what he would do. I remember walking in there and there was Tanner just air casts on his feet and a, and a morphine drip in his leg. My brother just holds it down. He's basically there for anything I need at any time. The doctor seemed to think that the morphine drip was going to last for the next day. And we're looking at this thing like, no way. Took him back up the hill to, to his house and then the fireworks began.
and about four in the morning, I have never heard a man scream like him. Tyson! Because ah! that morphine drip ran out and he couldn't Yo, get Tyson! to his pills, which yeah! was my fault because I forgot to leave him by his bed. It was almost scary, man. Like he just didn't want any part of it. And I had to just sit there and, and try and do everything I could to make him comfortable and you couldn't do it. I don't know, I think at that point, we thought we were totally invincible. It was just like, oh, here's a kicker, here's a landing, we're gonna stomp it easy, and you know, there was just, you know, we didn't think of the consequences, but I think Ooh. after that, we kind of realized that, you know, on the level of skiing we, we're at right now, things can go terribly wrong. Skiing's crazy, man, like, injuries come into play. A lot of people, like, will get taken out, get paralyzed, even die, and this and that. Like, almost every day, you know, some bad shit happens every day on skis. Dude, that kid splatters brains all over the fucking earth. He's dead. What? He died. I know he did. Crazy. He did die? Yeah. No way. Yep. How'd you hear that? Jimbo. What? Jimbo. No way. Yeah, this is recording. The guy died. Yeah. No. He did. He Jimbo. I talked to Jimbo because we've been communicating on the cell phones. Bummer, huh? Oh my god, dude. Oh my god, dude. I think that's why the heli took so long to get out. They knew there wasn't a rush, you know? Wow. All right, is it gotten slower? Not too many people can say that you know, they're so passionate about something in life that they'll wake up and risk their life daily to almost die for. It's always in the back of your mind, but that's where it is, and that's where it needs to stay. The reason why Tanner and all these skiers take the risk they do is, is because they love it, and that's it. You only know what I mean if you really love something. It's like why you would die for your wife, and that's the only thing that's relatable probably to someone who doesn't ski. Death can come in many different ways, and how I look at it, if, you're, if you die on the mountain, you know, if it's your time to go, you, to me, you kind of been blessed in a way, you know. The last doctor visit we had, he was able to put pressure on one leg. Surprisingly, my other foot right here feels really good. Really? Yeah. You could just see a whole new person come out. He finally saw the light. <laughs> yes! Right when I was hurt, it was like three months in a wheelchair, and then right when I was on my feet, it was just boom, 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 every day, just dedication. He was no longer confined. It was no longer wheeling himself to the bathroom you know, on a, on a little mechanics board. Uh, it was no more crawling up and down the stairs or having somebody carry him. Was, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get through this. I'm gonna start doing dry land training. I'm gonna start doing all this, you know, working out and I'm gonna win X Games again. And I was like, okay, that's the person I remember and I know. X Games the next year were the end of January. So it's only 10 and a half months that he had to recover and be back at the top. Actually, he wasn't even at the top of half pipe previous. He had to recover, and then he had to go to the top of a new sport he hasn't dominated yet. The first day he was back on skis that year, I and mean, I believe it was the end of November, and I just remember him calling me, and all he said to me was, bro, I'm back. I know he was in pain that next year, because I saw it, but he was able like, to put that out of his mind enough, you know, that when it came time, he could throw down. And then I headed right out to Finland to get some rails done. I think they're getting a lot of snow out there, so let's it's, get some nice power yeah, footage when you get that's back. That's what I'm saying, man. I'm going to be on the power mission this year. I want to be kind of recognized as a skier instead of a park rat, so let's do this. I'll see you in about a week. Yeah, good luck. Go feel that in Finland, man. All, right. and all of a sudden, you know, chilling in the restaurant, and that's when it happened. It just had a big, urgent message for me to make sure to call home as soon as possible, and, uh... Right in my mind, I already knew that, you know, something can't be good. CR uh, hit his head really hard. You know, he'll be here when you get back and we'll all figure it out when you come home. Just thinking he was fine and then getting off the airplane and <clears throat> going to the, right to the hospital and definitely wasn't expecting that. <laughs> That's when it all hit me like a pile of bricks in the face, you know, to see your best friend laid up on a hospital bed. He had a presser gauge drilled into his skull. He had tubes going in and out of his lungs through the side. They drilled 
like a hole through his ribs. The coma was what was bad, you know, because he was under he was under it and the, the one thing, man, he got pneumonia inside of his lungs and that right there was like, no, you gotta be kidding me. Is this kid gonna fucking die on me? You know, it's, it, it, what is going on here? Like, is God throwing us curveballs on purpose? Like, are we not put here on this earth to ski? Are we not meant to make these movies? And you start thinking what it's gonna be like if homeboy's not there with you anymore, man, you know? Every day I was in Utah, you know, I was there for a while and I, you know, we'd, I'd go there to his bedside and hang out every single day that I could. And I'm glad I did, man, because I remember the first day the motherfucker opened his eyes. Looked up, looked at him, and was like, yo, see up. And ran out in the hallway, and I just started bugging out, like, yo, the kid's awake. The injury left him completely paralyzed on one side of his body. He could not speak, eat, or relieve himself. Oh, no, like, as of right now, I don't ever see this kid getting back on skis again. And what's really crazy about the whole story is, man, it, it, it didn't take him t that much time whatsoever. The pace of CR's recovery had been blistering. In a few weeks' time, he had regained the use of his legs and was walking. Doctors were amazed at the progress. After 34 days in the hospital, he was finally discharged and on his way home. You know, it's going to take time, but I mean, you know, in only the last couple months, if he's gone that fast, then in two more months from now, it's, you know, he's coming back. It's going to be the same old kid, you know what I mean? And, uh, it's just a beautiful thing, man. I've been skiing my whole life and been a sponsored skier since I was 15. I wouldn't necessarily say I've ever taken it for granted, but I've almost lost sight of that. And then had a major reminder of how lucky I really am. And I've been working as hard as possible to keep this as my life. But when he hit his head, he came back as like an enlightened person. Like, I don't know where he went in that coma, but where he did go, it was insane. Cause when he woke up, he was, man, he was righteous. He was always preaching the righteous word. He was always, you know, talking about doing good to your woman, doing good to your family, doing good to your friends. And he would live it out. I mean, life is incredible. Never will I lose sight of that again, ever. And to be standing right here where we are today, I mean, CR's scheme, he's, he's back. I mean, he's, his head's more and more getting stronger every day. You know, so when I saw him back on skis again, it was inspirational. It made me want to ski just that much harder because it was just like, boo, yeah, buddy, you ain't going nowhere. This life I'm living, what I do every day, I mean, it's unreal. It's every single day I ski, every single day I'm out in the mountains with my friends, I love so much. It's like the richest day, the fullest day. It's every day, man, is an absolute blessing to be doing what I'm doing, and never will I take it for granted. No, I, I, I did know, notice a, a little bit of a change in him in that uh, he wasn't, uh, you know, the, the I'm the guy, I'm the man guy. He was, uh, a little more reserved, not a lot, but a little bit. I, I, th I think the accident made him realize he is mortal. I think it changed me for just a little bit. A couple years later, I felt invincible once again. People out in the industry, I'm sure, were probably talking about, ooh, Tanner broke both of his ankles. This is, he's done. Even leading up to X Games, I mean, that was probably the most nervous I've ever been because there was a lot of unknowns at that time. I, I didn't have an X Games gold and half pipe yet, you know, and that was, that was a huge thing for me, man. Every day, you know, he'll shred the mountain in the morning and go to the half pipe and just hike it, hike it, hike it, hike it. There's so much energy and puts so much energy into training. You know, you, you get to the X Games. I mean, he gets a, a high just here in the crowd. And after that training day, boy, I knew. I knew just from that I had the feelings. I mean, me and Ivory were talking quite a bit the night before, and it was like, he was like, this is yours for the taking, bro. It's just depending on what you want to do with it. It's not a question like what he's going to go and try and do. It's about what he's about to go and do. Because CR had to go home for more therapy right before the pipe event. 
But he told me, well, you better make damn sure I'm gonna be watching that on TV and you know what to do. This is your night. This is where you're most comfortable. This is where you shine. Do what you've always done. Tanner Hall, these guys train, they ride together. They're rock stars in this community. Here goes Tanner Hall, qualified first in the qualifying. I drop in and I had so all this energy like, ah, oh, yeah, come on. Dropped in, first hit, felt it. Second hit, felt it. Third hit, I'm like, okay, this nine is gonna be the biggest one I've ever done. I'm looking at my landing and I'm like, uh oh. Kind of over the deck a little bit. Ooh, just decked out. Harder than I've decked since I broke my ankles. And the one thing that went through my head is, all right, ankles are good. But why do I always fucking deck at a time like this? It's unbelievable. Second run, drop in, first hit. He's gonna get some amplitude and some trickery right now for you, folks. Huge 540. Second hit, third hit. Nobody wants to win this event as badly as Tanner Hall does. He's an absolute perfectionist. Fourth hit, fifth hit. And we're seeing him match the transitions with huge amplitude all the way down this pipe. He wants this so, so bad. There's the 1080 from Hall. Looked around, I took the deepest breath in. I just put my arms up in the air. I think Dumont might be taking another run, Uncle Lee. <laughs> <laughs> he took the words right out of my mouth. Well, the enigmatic, ever-present Tanner Hall. Is it going to be a battle like we had last year between Simon and Tanner? Yes, it oh, is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Then it comes to Simon, you know, where it was like, this kid is just straight ill, nasty in the pipe. There's nothing you can even really say. The kid charges really hard. I knew he wanted it, man. And right when he landed that last run, I mean, he, I, he no one's gonna deny it. He boosted, he boosted hard. So I'm sitting there like, okay, showtime. Coming down the last one, I just got bumped into second. Even though the scores didn't come in, I'm like, yo, oh, man, this is it. This is it, man. I'm not getting second place again, man. <laughs> no way. If Simon happens to overtake Tanner here, as they get better running by, then Tanner will have to apply uber pressure and make sure that he does something bigger and better than what Simon has done. He's sitting there waiting for a score, and all of a sudden, boom, came in. And I was sitting there like, no way! You see our Johnson mainly, this one's for you, kid. Yes, for you, CR. Yeah. That gives me chills right there. I was shaking. I was so excited for him. Did the surgery and he was in a wheelchair for two and a half months. And we just yeah. hung in there. In the back of my mind, I thought he could do it, but uh, when he actually did it, was pretty amazing. After you know a whole year of progression, he like took that progression, internalized it, saw it in his head what he needed to do, and did it. He's taken half pipe skiing to you know a new level. He was the first one to accomplish what I think a lot of us dreamed of doing was you know coming into it as a as a park skier and winning the contests in the park and then transitioning you know, out of the park and becoming, you know, a master in the backcountry. The living golf for your life to play. I'm your biggest threat right now. I'm your biggest threat right now. That's why they don't want me. I'm your biggest threat right now. I'm your biggest threat right now. That's why they don't like me. I'm your biggest threat right now. I'm your biggest threat right now. That's why they try to... Now after my first heli trip of just going out and, and filming and not just building jumps or nothing, like going out and just skiing, I knew it was on. Going out in helicopters and shredding deep pow, like that's every skier's dream. A lot of people study these mountains for weeks before they even take their route up and their mission down because it's, they're, they're, a lot of factors go into it. Anything can happen, you know, there's avalanches, there's cornice breaks. There's stuff hiding under the snow, there's, you know, rollovers that can lead to cliffs. You know, every single element of the big mountain is, is pretty gnarly. And knowing him and knowing his, his ski style, I didn't expect him to excel in backcountry or big mountain um, as well as he did. And, you know, an all-around skier, that's the most impressive thing to me. Somebody who can go and shred pow, go kill it in the backcountry, a couple weeks later come right to Aspen, you know, win the X Games. After that, go out and 
out and shred some more pow and kill it even more, like that's what impresses me for sure. I have a lot of respect for him as a big mountain skier. Um, some of the pillow lines that I've seen him shred, I don't think I've ever seen anybody shred those and they probably won't. And I mean, some, a lot of the lines that he skied were just so fluid and he didn't hesitate anywhere and went for it and spinning tricks. I love to see where the future skiing is going because it's fusing what people are doing in the park with what people are doing in big mountains and fusing lines and tricks and having fun, hitting jumps, being out in the mountains, exploring the sport of skiing. I love to see it going in that direction. The 2008 Powder Video Award for Best Male Performance, Tanner Hall. Where it's just you win athlete of the year, movie of the year, line of the year, undescribable, man. The best thing that I take in and that I feel best about is just the consistency factor through so many years. I said, you know, do you ever think you missed out on proms or dating or just taking a girl out for a date? And he says, you know, yeah, yeah. But he says, but a lot of kids don't get to do what I'm doing. But I think it kind of bothered him. I had met one girl not too long ago. She ended up being like really on point, super beautiful girl. I got scared, bro. I got, literally, I got scared. I got, I pretty much thought in my mind, I was like, yo, how, how, how what's she gonna think if I bring her into my life? It's definitely not impossible. It just takes the right combination and the right understanding, I guess. And, you know, it's, it'll be compromised for both people. No, it's not impossible. Like, say, me and my wife have been married 20 years. Is it? And I've been in the ski world. <laughs> All right, so Stevens passed May 2009. It was a TGR shoot, a park shoot, end of the year. I turned my phone on, and I probably had, I don't know, 50-some messages. Dude, I heard about your brother. Uh, I was wondering, you know, what, what the update is. And immediately, uh, you know, my heart sank again. Um, we believe that he's got broken legs. And I said, legs as in two? Yeah. Oh, well, then I lost him. And I just started crying and screaming. Pretty much within 10 minutes of Everyone getting up to the hill, Tanner hit this jump and went too far and landed really, really flat. Looked sketchy the whole week. None of us hit it. The day before I hit it, Wiley Miller hit it and uh, ended up breaking his heel and then hitting his face off his knee and break, busting his eye socket and needed a metal plate in his eye. And I should have looked at that and, you know, that should have been red flag right away. And right when I got to the top of the lip, I knew, like, this is bad, bad. That landing drop out, and when I hit the ground, it was the most painful, the scariest. The uh, it just uh, everything exploded in my knees. You know, like I thought my ankles were bad, but this was on a scale ten times worse. I thought I was paralyzed, man, because I was not moving. I couldn't even feel like the bottom half of my legs. Like it was just numb. People were touching them, and I couldn't feel it. What was going through my head right when I crashed was my career was over. Like I kept repeating that over and over again. The world kind of came to an end in my head that day. It was wild. They wanted to like fly me to Seattle to get surgery right away or something. And I knew if it was on my knees, I was like, nah. There's only one person I know that's touching my knees right now, and that was uh, Vernon Cooley here in Park City. So I knew I had to get back to Park City no matter what. The doctor that did Tanner Hall. Tanner's knees was the same doctor that did uh, Tiger Woods ACL. I went, oh my goodness, you're gonna drive home with Tanner Hall, <laughs> 15 hours with broken legs. No way would I have wanted to been in there. Worst drive of my life, bro. I would just start freaking out at times, cause, and then I would take a couple more of my pain meds and then it would be all good for like four hours and then it would just, the pain would come back. You know, I'd ask like, how much longer do we have? And he'd be like, dude, I hate to say this, but we've only been driving for seven hours. We're only halfway there. When he goes out, man, he goes out with a bang. And uh, he obviously operates in twos. He'd call every couple hours. <laughs> you know, it's tough. I go, Tanner, I, what am I supposed to do? I can't. I can't help. I love you, dog. I can't see anything. My ears. Standing up and going to, you know, going to the bathroom, take a piss, 
you know, like that. When you can't even do that, and you have to have your family carry you somewhere just to do that, and it's so painful just to do that, emotionally, mentally, physically, it, it was draining, really, really draining. It's the length of the injury. You know, it's almost double the time, uh, the healing process. He's a really strong human being, I guess, as well, because I wouldn't handle it, man. I'd probably, I'd probably end up a psych ward going nuts, man. I just abolished my PQ yesterday. Crazy. That's how nervous I've been. There were so many dark times where I just didn't see the end. I, I couldn't see light at the end of the tunnel, you know what I mean? And it was so easy to just get, you know, negative and be just a pain in the ass. You know, it's tough realizing who you really are in life and how much you really don't matter in this life compared to how you thought you did. Uh, this time I, I really feared for him. You know, I, knowing what a microfracture can do if it's not taken care of properly. I've seen a, a lot of people that haven't come back from one broken leg, and he has two of them right now. I've seen many people that haven't come back from one blown knee, and he has two now. I think if you ask me, I think the knee injury probably did end Evan Raps' career. It's like lonely and depressing. And then you just want to get back, and then when setback after setback, it's just, you know, for me, it made me rethink my whole life. As you get older, and like I am now, man, it's, my mind's working different. When you were younger, you'd hit a kicker, and all you could think about was to beat the other guy. And now it's like, should I really do this trick? Because I might, like, catch an edge and really hurt myself. You know, you look at guys like Michael Jordan. You know, the guy won so much. It had to have been a massive disappointment to not get to that peak again. I think the hardest part is the end. Coming to terms with it and then moving on and having to choose something to move on to. No, I don't think I could be happy without skiing, man. I don't. Yeah, I don't, man. I need that in my life to escape. There's got to be some balance in life too, though, you know? I mean, that's for, for a long time I wanted, that's how I thought I was going to be. If I couldn't ski, I was going to what was I gonna do? The problem is that you're, you've been really, really good at something among the best in the world, and then you're gonna have to do something else that you're probably gonna suck at it and not be in the best of the world. That a lot of people, you know, like to be around winners, and the winner can do no wrong. I think that has also, you know, made life a little unreal for Tanner. However, if he isn't winning anymore, does that still apply? Probably not. But when it's all over, that's not how life is going to be. And, and unless a person realizes that, once you get to that afterlife, it can be awful hard. Awful hard. The hardest part for me in this last year, just sitting down and dealing with my injury, was probably just keeping my sanity. I had a lot of time to reflect, and it, 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 it can make your mind bounce like a pinball in the middle of your head. Crazy, man. This is like the first time in my whole life I've been in one spot for more than three months. So it's like, not haven't been at airports, it's haven't, oh, it's crazy. You know, he, he needs instant gratification, and he needs to see results. It's just like a burning inside of you that you know you're going to be in this position for a long time, and it's not, it's not like it was before. Go to X Games after that, it was, it was tough, man, because you know, not being able to do, like I said, what you love to do, it sucks, man. What's the, what's the Tanner Hall update? It's just been a rough road, you know, was in a wheelchair for like two and a half months, and I still got a long road ahead of me, but I'm willing to walk it, and I just can't wait to get back to the mountains, you know? How are your knees doing? Getting there. Get me back on my skis uh, as soon as possible. Because without it, man, there's, there's an emptiness in me. And I think a lot of people can see it that I'm just not the same person I used to be. You know, he's succumbed to some, some things that maybe he shouldn't have. Yeah, I lost my sanity for sure for a couple months, like right around contest time. Going over and watching the Red Bull line catcher, one of the sickest events I've ever seen in my life. Simon Dumont, fuck that. Peter Lennox, fuck that. Kobe West, fuck that. You ain't the best. I'm sorry to say, we have Sean Pettit, we have Candy Tovex, we have CR Johnson. 
You have a contest like this, that's the best skier. This is real skiing. Real skiing on real mountains, on real snow, on real jumps, on real cliffs. I respect every skiing. Simon Dumont, Kobe West, Yunos, and everybody. I love you guys. Everything. Everything is good, but what you guys need to do is start thinking outside the box. The reason you're so big is because of park skiing, man. Like, it's from the X Games that gave you the opportunity to get all this budget to go and ski the backcountry like you do. He was on a mountain with big mountain skiers that were doing ill shit. If he was in a train park with the three illest train park skiers, they would have been the illest shit. So wherever he is, as long as people have their skis on, that's the illest. And no one, no one took Tanner seriously, I don't think. It's more like laughing at him, like he's making a fool of himself. I think his rep is being an amazing skier that is so excited that sometimes things come out of his mouth that he doesn't really think through. You know, more of the same. Tanner's drunk and mouthing off and it's, you know, he's out of line. Yeah, well, the drinking, I have, I have no excuses for that, you know. I, there, there's some people that can drink and have fun and there's some people that can drink and just get crazy and I'm one of those people. I've been drunk for a week. You know, you wake up and have another one. Tanner Hall or Glenn Plague's coming into town. Who wouldn't want to burn one and drink a beer? The only problem is we are actually professional athletes. I worry that maybe that some of the, or a lot of the negative influences that just kind of encompass his life, it might dislocate him from what he originally wanted to achieve. I know if I didn't change, I would be, uh, I wouldn't have, uh, you know, been able to continue doing what I was doing. Right? What made you realize that? The freaking concrete floor of a jail cell, dude. Who wants to freaking hang out down there? Right around this, you know, right around in October, where I just couldn't take it anymore. I knew how close it was to the ski season. I knew I wasn't gonna be skiing. And I knew I had a grip of fucking pain pills, man. A grip. Percocet, Oxycontin. Yeah, I needed them for pain. That's just straight up. But I had been eating them all summer, right? But how I should have been for my surgeries and my broken legs. But in October, pretty much got to the point where I did not need them, you know? Going nuts, going insane. The risk is becoming addicted where you don't have self-control and letting that get to the point where it's now interfering with your ability to function. Most of the mogul people I talked to that had knee surgery were addicted to painkillers for a year or two. It was easy for me to get really irritated. It was easy for me to just kind of feel real sad and lonely, man. It just feels like it gives you that, that extra little something that you need. And you know, maybe for four or five days, it, it'll feel like that, but that's all it takes to get hooked and basically find yourself four months down the road, just skinny as hell, not eating right, not going to the gym. The fine line is, this is the honest fine line. Take the narcotics At one point, I was so screwed up on drugs, I thought I didn't have nothing. So I'd start taking more drugs to fill that void of nothing, you know what I mean? And it just got out of control, man. It got really out of control. Ciara was noticing someone who wasn't recovering. He was noticing someone who was getting worse. So CR came to me and he, he was really worried and he just extended his, you know, his worry and told me that he's here and that's what best friends do with, you know, for each other. That was the first time my eyes got opened up to it, but I almost, I, I, I felt real nervous and kind of scared that he even noticed, you know what I mean? So I almost denied it to him for a little bit. And then I came clean and was like, yeah, man, I'm, this is, this sucks, you know? He was basically telling me that if I really want to come back with, with that shit in my life, it's just not going to happen. So, you know, he told me he almost had to go to rehab, but that he had quit and everything was cool. Kind of kept on the painkillers for a little bit after that. It would be a real shame if, that became the issue that, you know, prevented him from coming back. I mean, that's just a waste. Don't do anything that's going to prolong the inevitable, and that is, you got a problem. To just bounce along, isn't, you're not getting anywhere there. You've got to make a drastic change in one way or another. It's going to be a longer process to, uh, to maybe kind of weed those things out of his life.
I've watched him go through some experiences in the last year that have been absolutely heartbreaking. Like, broke my heart as much as anything has ever broke my heart. You know, I really needed to take a step back and evaluate a couple things. Went down to Jamaica and had it in my head that I didn't really want to drink at all. And we were starting a music company with Cali P and Black Phantom Sound, and we're trying to line up all of that, you know, in Kingston. And Everything was, you know, pretty good, feeling all right. One night we get a phone call in the hotel room, and it's like 3 in the morning, and it was uh, Tanner's ex-girlfriend, and she just answered, and it didn't, didn't make sense why she called, and she just let me know that um, CR passed away. <laughs> CR Johnson died after he fell over some cliffs that are known as the Light Towers. We are told it was an accident as his ski caught one of the rocks as he was taking off from a jump in that area. It took me like one second. I started screaming at Iberg, like, no, 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 no. And that's when it just hit me. I dropped to the floor, started screaming, locked myself into the bathroom for a while, just fucking bawled my eyes out like I've never bawled my eyes out before. And you start thinking what it's going to be like if homeboy's not there with you anymore, man. gut-wrenching feeling. I've never felt like that. I mean, that feeling is a million times worse than breaking your legs, breaking your ankles, breaking your heels, breaking your ACLs. I mean, I'd break everything all over again to get him right back here, you know what I mean? But that's not possible. I think that just destroyed Tanner, you know? When that one person that was calling him out, you know, and that one person that's been his friend the longest was no longer there, man. I don't, I don't think he knew where to look for any direction. Nighttime would fall and I would just want to drink myself away. Just uh, what happens when Tanner drinks is, is, it's not Tanner. How I dealt with it was, you know, not good. CR wouldn't have been proud. You know, and I haven't seen Tanner since CR's funeral to this day, but I think he hadn't processed it yet, to tell you the truth because it's, he seemed really normal. The severity and the gravity of it, it didn't seem like it had really hit him. Maybe at the time he wasn't ready to deal with it. I mean, it's a lot. And that night I, you know, I ended up getting really, really drunk. So what happens with drugs and alcohol, it, everything just gets suppressed. And it's still in there, you know? And maybe skiing can cover him up without drugs and alcohol because skiing is a drug, if you ask any skier. It, it, they, they love that shit. There's so much more to life than skiing, and it really showed me how much my life has just been involved in only skiing, and that's it, you know what I mean? And sometimes, you know, that stress can build up and you start treating the people around you, the people that mean most to you, you know, kind of shitty. When that alcohol pushes you over the line where you're disrespecting maybe only a handful of people that truly care or love for you, that's, I think that was, that was probably Tanner's rock bottom. Alcohol will make you get out of control, but you know, right after that, you go into this mode where you just feel like shit. And you'll, and you'll never see Tanner be disrespectful to friends or family unless alcohol is in the picture. Yeah, well, it was gnarly, man. Pretty much a big reason how I got off the pain pills and how I got off the drugs and everything. It was uh, taking the real people that meant more in my life than anything. It's one of those things you don't want to do, but you, you have to tell him. Iberg pretty much stuck it to my face. And uh, he basically looked at me and he's like, you know what, dude, I, 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 I can't do this anymore. I'm not gonna sit here and watch you, watch you kill yourself. With everything we got going with inspired music and inspired media concepts, it, it's basically a do or die situation. You know what I mean? If I, if I want it, he'll, he'll stick around and help me out. But if I want the drugs and he's gone, you know what I mean? And that was huge to hear from, you know, I needed that. This is one of the few times in life I had this conversation where he took in what I had to say, you know, because I think he saw how concerned I was for him. And, you know, I think he took it to heart. It's just like, Iberg's it. He's the closest dude I got in my life. And once he basically put it to me like that, then there's a big realization. You know, luckily through time, I saw that I couldn't be like that. It wasn't really a moment. It was just kind of, it happened gradually, you know what I mean? Because yeah. getting off that shit right away, it, it can be painful. The less dose, 
my back, I just started noticing my back started hurting and little things like just like withdrawal symptoms, you know what I mean? Just not feeling good, not just not almost kind of sick every day in a way for like two weeks, right? Not, not the drugs at all. It's really hard to battle kind of the alcohol. And so it compounds and you have to be very, very careful of that social pressure. But I'll tell you, it's tough when you're around it and that's why I'm just not putting myself in those situations right now. I won't be drinking tonight, but hey, you wanna stay up till three in the morning? I'm here, dude. In fact, I'm not drinking, so if you guys need me to drive me anywhere, I'm straight up. And you know what? Ain't nobody ever called me out. I don't mix well with alcohol and you know, I'm ready to move forward without that shit in my life, man. If he's hiding anything right now, I don't know. But you know, he, he wants to be a better person. He wants to change. A little bit of ganja, keep the head clear. That's pretty much all I need. There's definitely been some demons that have, that have come to light through the whole process. He's working his way through those and you know, we're getting closer to the light at the end of the tunnel now. My knees don't feel 100% right now whatsoever, but they're coming more and more. And that's, you know, I know this is gonna be a long recovery still. The main thing for me was that he turned out to be a good kid. That hasn't changed. That's still the one thing I want more than anything. You know, losing your best friend and going through an injury like this, it's, it kind of opens your eyes, you know? It sucks that it takes something like that to open your eyes, but it's time to grow up. It, it, there comes a time when maturity has to set in because, you know, if I kept living like I did, I wouldn't be alive for too much longer. The new goal is to obviously come back and do well, but the, a big goal is just, you know, becoming a better person in life, you know. It feels so good to just actually see the light for the first time and to know that I'm going to wake up every day and be that better person. Whatever. I had the best life and I've had the best time in my life and it's just getting started in my eyes. This is only chapter one. Wait till you guys see chapter two. And I know he's going to come back and I know he's going to be even more pissed at the world and he's just going to give her. I just heard the Olympics are getting accepted in 2014, so that puts a spark in the back of my mind where, you know, the sky's the limit, you know. The kid is not going to stop skiing. I can't imagine that. That's, that's like impossible. I think if you cut his legs off, he'd be a sit skier. Plus, he can always just go back and live with Darla and Jerry. <laughs> you know? Fuck it. He's got a loving family in Montana, you know? Find a nice girl. <laughs> Big dump truck Montana girl. So I, I, I hope that for him, to find that special somebody. And I know she's out there. Maybe you can't find anybody better than mom. <laughs> It'd be nice to have a nice wife and some kids and white picket fence and a little doggy and... That sounds pretty cool. Tanner is, is a legend, you know. Tanner, Tanner's name is written in skiing history. He just owns his own discipline. He just owns his own world. He's the best at what he does. It's like, just look at this kid. He's the best thing owner on skis, you know. For a little kid to have a dream of being a professional skier, so he kind of paved a way for that, so kids nowadays can have that dream. This is basically a kid who pioneered a sport. And truly he did. He became the poster child of the sport. If he can get into a place where you know, he's really comfortable with himself, yeah, he can be around forever. And he will influence our sport forever just because he really has that love for our sport, just like Flake. He's got opportunities right now to, uh, to be a skier for many, many, many years, to be a, uh, an icon in the sport. I think he's got a long way to go. I think there's a ton of te ski technique that he does not necessarily um, know yet. His life in one aspect is certainly even, hasn't even begun, but at the same time you look back at what he's accomplished and it's quite amazing. And he'll probably ski till he's 85, and he'll probably always be super competitive and not like it that the young kids are doing tricks that he can't do. That's the sport, that's the way it goes. I think the further down the road we go, the better Tanner we see. And I really believe that. My family inspires me, my friends inspires me, my brother just got married, that inspired the shit out of me, man. C.R. Johnson inspires me, you know what I'm saying? That's big right there. Johnson inspires me just because I was, he was the most righteous human being in this world. That's my best friend. He's gonna, no matter where he is, he's looking out for me. And I feel like he stands with me every single solitary day, somewhere, somehow. 
And to have that on your side, that's, I got my guardian angel. It's pretty sick, you know. Not too many people can say I have their, their best friend is their guardian angel, so righteous. Even if you're gone, if you're gone you will always live on. Always live on. You're on. real born champion. Even if you're gone, you will always live on. Every morning, now you're about the mountain top. Thinking about you, make we more time happy and sometimes sad because we miss you. Really miss you. We miss you. We really miss you. Hey. I remember very well every day that we did live together. Slime pants, no sky high, we born with together. Oh, ya now. You so miss my brother, so let me sing this song Cause you ain't taking letters What a connection, what a life we live You're most righteous and so positive Now the world is yours, my brother, look on it I want you to know we're so proud for what you did Cause we can see your eyes every morning Now you're by the mountain top Thinking about you Make we more time happy and sometimes sad Because we miss you Really miss you we really miss you No joke, remember, we were still kids Traveling the globe, getting all these chicks We ski, we party, party, party without quit So wicked, none of them couldn't miss So much things the sea grew up with CR is chronic and righteousness CR, tell them champions ride like this No worry, because everything Chris And we can see your eyes every morning Now you're the mountain top Thinking about you, make we more time happy and sometimes sad because we miss you, we miss you, we miss you, we really miss you. Hey, hey, hey. Really, really miss you, we really, really, really miss you. Hey, hey, hey. And everybody sing it now, we miss you. We